Uh, good morning, everybody. And on behalf of the Education Committee, I'm John Hobbins, and we'd like to welcome you to the seminar this morning. This is actually our 14th one this season, so this, the seasons have gone by very quickly. And before we get started, I have a few housekeeping chores. Uh, next Tuesday, March 21st, I'm going to visit with the, uh, shall we say, the handsome and knowledgeable Kirk Ogori out of Pete's Golf in Mineola. And we're going to Zoom that. And Kirk's going to take us through some fitting as well as uh, some of the new equipment for the season. And then the following week, uh, Sam Wiley has a head professional transition. And he has uh, Sean Quinn Livin who is out at Kennecott, and then Nick Yon, who recently went over to Century, and um, Reed Howie, who's now out at Piping Rock, and how they transition from one high-profile club to another, and you know the, the challenges that they saw, their interviewing process, and so forth. So I, I think it's a it's a good idea, you know, to to tune in to that one, especially uh, for those of you who are, are looking to transition, you know, and maybe in your your first jobs and, and looking to, to move in a few years to a, to a higher profile job. So it's nice to have the experience of those professionals who, uh, who are good players as well as you know, good golf professionals. Uh, April 10th, we have our spring meeting at Weeburn. And then on April 25th, we have our educational summit, our spring educational summit, which will be done at the Trump Golf Links at Ferry Point. Uh, that'll be outdoors. Uh, presentation with James Seekman, a short game expert with tour players, as well as Bernie Najar, who is the Middle Atlantic PGA Teacher of the Year, and also works with long drive guys, and currently Kyle Berkshire, who is the world long drive champion. So put those on your calendar, April 10th, April 25th. And if you go to the website, there are banners at the top of the website. We'll have the links on that uh, Noah put up, so you can, you can sign up there. Uh, interesting program this morning. It's going to be a two-part program. And uh, the first part is going to be about wage an hour, which is very important because you have to make sure that according <laughs> to state and federal regulations, that you're abiding by the rules. And uh, which for most people today is going to be very difficult because you have to have a good understanding of what goes on and when you're when you're actually you know violating a rule or when you're not. So uh, we're very fortunate this morning to to have that program as our first part. And then the second part is our deferred compensation, which is the highly anticipated and program that the PGA of America has put out. And basically what deferred compensation is, is by volunteering your time in different programs, which will be explained to you, you earn, for lack of a better term, because I'm not sure they're gonna call them credit hours, but you'll earn hours toward deferred compensation for your retirement. So, for those of us who, who want to retire, let's volunteer some time and, and create some deferred compensation. Uh, it took me all of about 25 seconds to sign up earlier this month, so it's, it's a really easy process. So this morning, um, when we get into the wage and hour, we're, we're very fortunate. We have Jonathan Gold, who is the regional director of the Northeast area for the PGA of America. Many of you know Jonathan because he's done a lot of work with the section with career services. Many of you have called upon Jonathan because he's an expert when it comes to club relations, contracts, he is constantly negotiating on behalf of our golf professionals you know, throughout the region and has done other programs for us. And for me, is is a uh, not only a professional friend but a personal friend because I rely on Jonathan a lot. I call him a lot. He always returns my calls with, with good, solid information and is a real touchstone for me with what goes on at national. So very happy to have Jonathan. Uh, along with Jonathan is Ben Hoffine, who is the director of golf at the Westchester Country Club, which never closes. You know, as you know, Ben has thirty six holes and a a nine hole par three and. Uh, Basically, Westchester would be a, a mini corporation among golf uh, companies. Ben has you know, a, a very big operation, so a very big staff and has a lot of experience with wage and hour. And then Jim McCann is over. Uh, Jim McCann is a golf professional. And uh, Jim has a lot of experience in wage and hour. And so we're very, very happy to have experienced golf professionals who have gone through this, who understand how not to violate the laws and with that, Jonathan, good luck. And thank you for doing this for us this morning, gentlemen. John, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you and the Education Committee for allowing us to uh, be with 
you today, the professionals, the Metropolitan PGA, it's obviously always a pleasure. Uh, wage an hour is certainly not the most exciting thing in the world, uh, but however, it, it is very important. And the question gets asked, so, well, why does a PGA member have to be aware of this? Uh, you know, things have changed over the years. You, you certainly can have an HR specialist or even an HR department at your facility. Uh, but again, if you are hiring a hiring manager, um, you should be aware of some of the rules and regulations and just ensure that you, you know, you're in compliance. I think for us, one of the hot topics that's come up over the years uh, is certainly the independent contractor status and, and caddies. Um, but with that being said, a lot has changed, right? So it's funny, I was looking back on um, you know, just how much it changed. In, in 1988, you were allowed to give uh, a polygraph test. Uh, that was totally legal, right? Can you imagine uh, a world we live in now where you're allowed to give an employee a polygraph test, right? It's just, it's just different. The questions that you ask in your, uh, your interviews, when you're hiring, uh, the way you uh, announce the job and have to put the job description out in the, uh, the open market, uh, the compensation, and all these things we're going to try to touch on for you today. Uh, but during you know during this time, I, I just want to say that you know I, I I am certainly not an expert. The call to action for everyone in this room is: if you feel that you might be borderline of com compliance or have a question, there are additional resources for you. Certainly, Jim, Ben, and, and myself are more than happy to you know answer the call and talk things through with you. But our call to action is certainly to seek legal counsel. Uh, they are the ones that are most up to date with the rules and regulations. They see it every single day. And not only that, um, you know, th there everyone here has probably has a hypothetical issue at hand, and everyone's situation is just different. Uh, there's nothing that's just by the book and textbook. So that being said, we certainly recommend seeking legal counsel should you have anything that you'd like to discuss. Uh, and and also both, we we work in two states here, Connecticut and New York State has. Uh, ample resources for you to seek out as well, even if you want to just send an email or contact someone uh, in their in their department, you're able to do so. Now, with that being said, uh, Jim and Ben, I'm going to kind of narrate here a little bit for you. You certainly have been a resource for me over the years, ever-changing. Ben, I remember that we had conversations before about when Department of Labor came out with the exempt status and how to go about that. Uh, and there's some intricacies in there. But gentlemen, I'm just going to turn it over to you and kind of give a brief um, synopsis of, you know, how things changed during your 10 years, PGA professionals and wage and hour compliance and from where it was maybe 15, 20 years ago to just the importance of, of it today. Uh, Jim, I'll call on you first. Sure. Um, well, basically the way i look at it is that if the person is on your property and they work for you they need to be getting paid and that that is very different than when what when i first started in the business and and i think it's still different than what people have done or still doing in some ways i think you know golf pros make their money in various ways they teach they have juniors they work in the shop they get paid by the club they get paid by their students and, and, and kind of, there are laws and rules that, that need to be followed to do that. So um, the difference is, is that everybody on my staff, if they're on the property, will be getting paid. And, and a golf club is a unique place also in that it's a place that people who work for you may want to hang out and, uh, and play and use the facility, even if they're not working. And, and we don't allow that really. I mean, unless you're getting paid, you can't be on the facility. And uh, and that includes lessons. And I know Ben will have some, some ways that they do things at Westchester to kind of help deal with that cost. But everybody who works for you should be getting paid every time they're in the facility. And I don't think enough people realize that or do that. And that includes while teaching. And I, and, and so it's taken a while to kind of get that 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 settled, but I, you know, most most pros are not really used to that. But uh, but it's working out, and I think you know I, I sleep pretty well at night knowing that uh, that we're doing it right. Thanks, Jim. Ben. Yeah, I think it's um, important for everybody to know. I know when I um, started in this business 25 years ago, almost everybody was just paid a set salary of X amount per week. You got 100% of your lessons, or maybe a percentage of your lessons, depending on the facility. You worked an awful lot of hours and you loved what you did and you loved how you got paid and uh, hopefully you made enough money to survive. And with the advent of exempt versus non-exempt employees, um, especially in the state of New York and 
we're assuming Connecticut or I'm assuming Connecticut does the same thing. Um, it's very, very important for people to realize that you can't just pay people a set salary per week, give them all their lessons and have them work 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Um, only exempt employees um, are exempt from overtime and non-exempt employees have to be paid overtime, even if they're paid a salary instead of hourly. Um, and whether or not you know employees are exempt or non-exempt is the tricky part. And, and that's where we at Westchester really, we have a, a test that we give everybody. Our legal department and our HR department have come up with some standards for exempt versus non-exempt employees. And I think it's, uh, it's important that all of us at least know those because if something were to come up um, with any kind of labor, labor laws, I think about 90% of golf employees, especially assistant professionals, would be considered um, non-exempt employees. And they are due overtime for any hour worked over 40. Ben, let's dive into that a little bit more, right? So like our fear is with, just specifically right now, let's concentrate on the assistant golf professionals, right? And they have to pay, pass two things to be an exempt employee. They have to pass the duties test and the salary test, right? The salary test uh, for New York for the, is uh, $1,125 per week, um, but it can't be all lessons, right? That's correct. That's, not for, only... that's for Westchester, Long Island, and New York. Correct. Yep. Uh, Rockland and Upstate is a little different. A little less. Yep. Thanks, Jim. Um, but only a, a certain percentage of like your lessons can be attributed to that. I think it's 10%, 10%. of ancil ancillary compensation. So, you know, Ben, can you just talk through some things that the club has done over the years uh, to, to try to be in compliance with wage and hour laws and regulations, specifically like the assistant golf professionals? Yeah, certainly. And so one of the things that we do at Westchester is um, only one in eight employees can be an exempt employee. And the reason for that is to be an exempt employee, you have to have um, managerial capabilities, and that primarily is hiring and firing um, staff. So if you're assistant golf professional, and you don't specifically hire people and you don't specifically have the authority to fire people, more than likely you're going to be a non-exempt employee. Um, while this, I don't believe this is a state, um, a, a state rule at Westchester, we don't allow any, if you're an exempt employee, you have to manage at least eight people. So if you're at a facility that may only have six or seven golf employees, you probably can only have one exempt employee and more than likely that's going to be the head golf professional. So everybody else at Westchester, um, no matter what their position here, is paid an hourly wage. Um, and then that, that gets a little tricky with our teachers because they obviously make um, a lot more than 10% of their, their hourly rate or their total compensation and lessons. And the state of New York, um, <laughs> and Jonathan, you may want to tip into this, but they don't consider golf professionals part of their professional exemptions. And so when you are talking about commissions, and it's really any kind of commission, but in, in our instance, it's really less than commission they're due overtime on that if they're working more than 40 hours a week. And so that's where it gets, where it gets a little tricky because you have to add up their, um, their total wages for the week. And more than likely that's just an hourly wage plus their lessons to come up with, with an overtime rate. So it gets, it gets very confusing. Um, the other thing that's important to know in the state of New York is you can't give an employee a bonus based on time worked. So you can't pay somebody hourly and then at the end of the year, end of the month, give them a quote, quote, bonus for their lessons that are taught. Um, that has to be factored into overtime. And if you are going to give people a bonus, it has to be, be a, a merit based bonus, not a time worked or money raised bonus. Yeah, Ben, that's accurate. The, the professional exemption, there's three um, exemptions or, or duties. That's the administrative, executive and professional the professional exemption, again, seek legal guidance on here if you're in compliance, but that's really a learner professional, someone that has ex uh, exemplary knowledge in sciences or education, right? One can make the argument a PGA professional would probably qualify, but again, uh, you should seek out some additional resources to, to make sure you're in compliance uh, with that. Ben, I'm going to circle back to you on this because I think it's it's something that we kind of run into with our professionals from time to time that we might not be in compliance. And I think that that you and the team at Westchester have gone through a very thoughtful way 
of making sure that all your T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Um, but Jim, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you for a second here as well, because you mentioned before um, about compliance, about pay, and then everyone on property, they're being paid, right? So I think that when we talk about our hourly employees, we talk about free golf, right? And free golf is very interesting. I think some of our professionals can get into trouble where they, they treat free golf as a benefit. And in fact, you know, you, you likely should have them on the clock when they're on property. So Jim, do you mind just touching on that a little bit? This is correct. And I mean, I'm at a public course. So, you know, over the years, uh, working at public courses, it's been a benefit to be able to offer free golf to the ranger or to the starter or whoever's working as kind of a, you know, extra pay kind of thing. But, uh, you know, as as Ben works for a big organization, I work for a fairly big organization as well, Applied Golf a Management Company, and uh, and they have a pretty extensive human resources department. And basically, uh, that's not that's not the way it's done. You have to pay those people if they're on property, even if they're playing golf because of the fact that they're still kind of representing the club on the property. And again, like I said before, you know, being a golf course, you know, if you work in an office, you know, they're trying to get people to not have you hanging around for nothing and, and using your labor for nothing. But uh, that, that applies to us as well, even though some of us don't mind hanging around and, and playing golf and being there. But to protect everyone, I think that uh, that law is definitely in place. You must pay someone, even if they're playing golf at your facility. Now, obviously, that applies to golf professionals, but it also applies to your starters and your rangers and anyone else, your range employees. Any of those people still have to be paid. So if they're on 40 hours uh, and they go play golf, you're paying them overtime. And just to go back to Ben's point quickly, I have there are two exempt employees at, uh, out of about 40 plus employees at Spook Rock, myself and my first assistant, who is a manager, assistant manager as well. Um, so to Ben's point, we don't do a lot of that either. It's, it's all hourly employees. And, uh, and to your point, they're getting paid when at the facility. Thanks, and I Jeff. have to manage that. I have to manage that, their ability to play golf along with how much they're going to get paid because my whole thing is, you know, keeping people under 40 hours. And then to that point, Jim, I know, you know, we had a conversation prior to this educational event today. Ben, you mentioned the club does something even when they're off property. So one could make the argument if you had an assistant professional that's playing with members outside of the property or even playing in tournaments outside of the property that could be classified as, um, you know, doing business on behalf of the employer. So, Ben, you, you kind of want to just give some insight on that? Yeah, we look at it as when a golf professional is playing in a tournament and whether that's a Met PGA tournament, MGA tournament, WGA tournament, or a pro um, with members or representing the club, we pay them six hours um, for, for each of those tournament rounds. So if somebody's playing in the, the New York State Open, um, they're getting three days of, of six hours of pay because they are representing the club. And um, we, we do that uh, across the board with all of our employees. Yeah, it's, I mean, certainly that is, I think for some that are on the call, this is kind of like eyebrow raising. It's definitely a change from what, what the norm was, even the free golf. Um, you know, I remember back in the day, you, you give a golf lesson, you clock out to give your golf lesson and then, um, you know, clock back in. And that's, that's certainly not the case. If you were on the property, and in this example, even when you're off the property doing business on behalf of the club, representing the club, you, you, you should probably, if you're a non-exempt employee, yeah, you likely would be uh, on the clock at that time. Jonathan, um, question. Go ahead, John. So if if a head professional, let's take you know Mike Meehan out at Old Westbury. So if Mike has staff that wants to practice on their games after work, the way I'm understanding this is that staff needs to be compensated for the time they're on their own practicing. Yeah, technically that 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 is a yes. Yeah, if they're on the grounds and they're working on their craft, um, they they are uh, obviously it's it's very black and white when they're playing golf with a member. Uh, but even when they're on property, um, you know, one could make the argument that they are working on themselves developmentally um, and and at the facility. And certainly, if they're striking up a conversation while they're hitting balls on the range with a member that comes by, right? Like, you just want to eliminate the gray areas again. Um, I don't know, Ben or, or Jim, if you have any context on that as well, as far as uh, practicing. But to me, that would go in the same same context as you know, playing on the golf course. I'll just make one comment, and um, 
I think Jonathan is correct on this, but we're going to reiterate this a lot today. Please talk to lawyers or an HR firm <laughs> to get all this. But by no means are we uh, <laughs> professing what the, the state of New York will tell you. I know um, a lot of times if we have somebody scheduled for eight hours and they're going to come back after that and practice, um, we will not necessarily have them clocked back in, but it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Um, the, the state of New York or the state of Connecticut will certainly be able to guide you um, and all that. I think you have to take the golf aspect out of it for a little bit and think of if you are any kind of other uh, employee at any other type of job. And if you go into the office to work on your own craft, you're you're going to get paid. Mm -hmm. um, have to think about that from a golf standpoint. Take the the recreational side of golf out and put the professional side of of any profession in. I think so, that's a great way to think about it. Of, of trying, you know, if you think, you know, if you're not sure if it's right or wrong, how would it go in an office? And uh, I think that should be your answer. That's that's crazy to me. Well, there are also people who live at the club. And I mean, what is the rule in that situation? I don't have that issue, but many people do. But if you live on site, it's uh, technically you're never off the clock, are you? Exactly. I mean, well, you, you, we're clocking in and out. Um, yeah. But yeah, John, great question. Again, and to, to Ben's point, got to seek representation. There are a lot of hypo hypotheticals that are at play here. And you really now more than ever, you have to make sure that you're buttoned up. We I, Again, we hear a lot about the independent contractor things. But there's a lot in our world that just, just falls into the gray areas, whereas you know, it's golf, it's a recreational activity, but it's also a professional activity. And, and the less we can blur the lines, the more that you're going to be in compliance. Again, you may have HR at, at your club or facility. You may not. Uh, your general manager might be your HR person. Uh, but again, uh, it's still going to fall back on the PGA professional, specifically the head professionals that is managing a team out there to kind of be a little bit aware of you know, the ever-changing laws. Um, I'm going to shift gears uh, a little bit here, but still kind of work under the context, Ben, of the exempt versus non-exempt. And you kind of mentioned to me about your employees not actually being your employees, but being all employees of the club. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, about that transition and the reason for having your staff um, be all employees of the club, even though you have the golf shop as part of your concession? and the pros and cons of that. Sure, so when uh, I had 13 years of experience at Waikil where I had the entire golf concession, bag room range, golf shop, and then I paid 100% um, of the golf employees outside of the caddy manager. Um, when I came to Westchester seven years ago, that model flipped a little bit and it actually flipped here at Westchester in the past, um, John Kennedy, who was here prior to me paid a, a big chunk, if not all of the golf employees and the club changed that. And they, they changed it at that time. Obviously it was a good transition time, but they wanted to make sure that they were hundred percent compliant with labor laws. And so every employee um, here, golf employee is paid by the club. And there's some real positives to all the employees for that. Um, they're eligible for the club's healthcare plan. They're eligible for retirement. Um, all the benefits that the that the club has to offer for all of the employees that the golf employees are now um, eligible for that. Now, the one part that it did do is the club now had to absorb a lot more payroll. They have to absorb all the ancillary costs with that payroll taxes, healthcare benefits, all those um, expenses the club had to take over. So we um, being compliant with changing, we had to change a, a, the way a lot of employees were changed because a lot of them are paid five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a week, whatever their weekly salary was. And then every month they got a check for their lessons. That that's not compliant for New York State labor laws. And so we changed almost all the employees. We have about 50 golf employees. We have six exempt employees. So we have six people that are paid a salary. The other 44 are all hourly uh, employees. And um to make sure that we were covered with the overtime laws, the, our HR department um, and, and help with attorneys came up with a, a pretty good formula to pay our teachers where they're paid an hourly rate. They get paid um, their lessons. The club pays 10%, uh, takes 10% of, of their lessons, but that gets thrown right back to the employee for any hour they get. They work over 40 hours a week. Um, when you 
have commission that's more than 10% of your weekly salary, that has to be factored into your, your overtime rate. So Jonathan just put up um, a spreadsheet with some different scenarios, the, the top scenarios, one, two, and three, and four. Um, you can see that's an hourly rate of $20 an hour, regular hours, there's a total. Um, there's some different weekly lesson totals on there. And then if you did just a straight time and a half overtime, which a lot of people do of hourly rate, there's your, your new overtime rate at 30 hours. You see a, a, the additional total, then the weekly total, and then what the, the total the employee gets. That's not compliant for the state of New York. You have to factor in the total lesson commission for the week to get an overtime rate. So if you look at the bottom half of the spreadsheet, um, the hourly rate remains the same. The lessons for each scenario also remain the same, same. But if you look, there's a huge difference in overtime pay. And the way that is calculated is you take not only their weekly wage times 40 hours, which is 800, you have to take their total lesson commission in and then divide that by 40 and then multiply that number by one and a half. So you can see their overtime rate. And in some instances, if you give $3,000 of golf lessons the middle of July and you've worked, you've clocked in for 64 hours, your overtime rate for those extra 24 hours is actually 142.50 an hour. And so if you look at um, the far right columns, the club takes 10% of those lessons, but this is beneficial to the employee. Um, taking 10% of the lessons, a lot of people and some of the employees at Westchester at first were a little skeptical of that, but when you show them this sheet and you show them that, hey, the more you teach and the more you work, you're actually gonna be paid more than you would in the, the traditional way. Um, this helps offset the expense to the club. The club actually, probably generates a little bit more income in the shoulder months or the winter months when, when employees or teachers are working less than 40 hours a week. But we have never had a situation in my seven years here where um, an employee, a golf professional has been shorted any of those dollars. So this, this is beneficial to the club. I know it's a little confusing. Um, I've talked to plenty of professionals in the past about how we do things here. Um, it, it it's something that that needs to be done if there was ever an issue with with an employee and, and how they were paid at your facility. And Ben, just for context, this is this is regarding non-exempt employees, right? Because we're talking about an hourly wage here and making someone whole based on their hourly wage when they give lessons. It, that's correct. That's non-exempt employees. And even if you were to pay a non-exempt employee a salary, which you can do. You just need to understand that when they work more than 40 hours a week, they're due an overtime wage based on their income. And their income um, has to be at the, 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 I know in Westchester County, minimum wage is $15 an hour. Um, if you're an exempt employee, you have to be paid a minimum of $1,125 per week. And then you have to check all those other boxes. And if that's the case, whatever their lesson commission is, they can take 100% of that and they're not due overtime on any of those hours. But you have to check all the boxes to be to be exempt from overtime. Correct, yep. And that's kind of like what is more of the traditional model of the assistant golf professional. They, they are paid salaried, uh, they pass the salary test where they're over 1125. They, they pass the duties test, either professional, administrative or executive. And then they would incur, you know, their, the full share of lessons uh, based on the agreement with the club. That's correct. Perfect. Um, now, let's kind of switch gears a little bit here. And so like the, a topic that's been brought up a lot uh, recently, specifically with caddies, but I, I kind of want to save the caddies for the end or another conversation. We want to talk about independent contractors and specifically how independent contractors are dealt with your facilities. Jim, I don't believe you have any independent contractors. I have no independent contractors. And do, is there a reason just because? Uh, I think we stay under wage and hour laws much better paying people by the hour and paying overtime and doing all these things. There's just a lot of gray areas in the independent contractor and how you break that up. And I think we're just more comfortable paying hourly. Yep. And I think that's probably been the transition of clubs recently is if you want to be fully compliant, just take all reasonable doubt out of the picture and just don't have any. 
Ben, I think it's the same for you as far as independent contractors, you, none, or is there agreements and, and what the agreements entail? And can you kind of dive in a little bit about that? Yeah, that's correct. We also do not have any independent contractors. Um, however, um, I'm fairly familiar with this uh, scenario, and I think it's it's really important to differentiate between an independent contractor and employee of the club. And um, I'm sure the caddy situation may come up a little later, but even for golf professionals, if you're paying, I think the, the most common situation is where you have a teacher that may use your facilities, act as an independent contractor, give golf lessons there. It's really important if you're classifying them as an independent contractor. The only thing that they're doing is what they're there to do as an independent contractor. So if they're a teacher, that means they can't work in the golf shop. That means they can't help with a tournament. It means they can't move carts. They can't do anything else but teach. They should not wear club apparel. Um, they should be able to come and go as they please and also to use other facilities at will. Um, they cannot be scheduled. You cannot tell them when to come, when to leave. It truly has to be independent of everything else that the, the club is doing. And while it may seem to be an easy way to pay instructors to do that, I think in almost every scenario that those the independent contractor um, test is not being passed by golf professionals that are being paid as independent contractors. And you tie yourself up as a golf professional when you limit yourself by, by working with an independent contractor rather than someone that works for the facility, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, agreed. Uh, now, Ben, uh, as far as uh, this may tip a little bit into the caddies, but I, I do know that there are some agreements, right? And and, and when we were speaking before, you, you said that, you know, agreements are great, but it it's just kind of a layer. Any any context there? Yeah, and that's I, I think this has changed a lot in the last um, four or five years. Um, we work with Jackson Lewis, who is a, a big labor law firm, and they work with a lot of clubs in the area. And, and six years ago, they would tell you not to have any independent contractor sign any type of agreement that basically says they're an independent contractor, because at the time they they thought that that was, hey, that's actually an employee employment agreement, even though it's stating that they're an independent contractor, because you now have a relationship between the club and this independent contractor with rules laid out. You, you can't really have that. And so, but that that has changed now. Um, I know um, some of the law firms that are working with, with several of the clubs that have um, some of these caddy issues now are, are requesting and requiring that independent contractors do sign a a document that states that they are independent contractors. Um, and, and certainly that adds another, another layer. Um, and I think that the term layer is important. It's not protection. It's another layer of protection because uh, as we've probably seen in the area the last um, decade, there's, there's no real protection from some of these independent contractor issues. And, and just so also everyone's kind of aware in the call, there, there's new, um, independent contractor laws and regulations that is in a comment period right now. Uh, I think the comment period ended December 31st, but they're still reviewing it and they're going to make it even simpler, uh, but also at the same point, even a little bit harder for someone to classify someone as an independent contractor and independent contractor, right? So there's some language that's being used as, are they an integral part of the business? Are they able to incur a profit and or a loss? Uh, do they have their own equipment? Like those type of things. And um, if you're able to check yes on those, then they're an independent contractor. But if any of those are no, then they are should be treated as an employee. And I think that you know, as we all know, the golf courses and facilities, when you get into the independent contractor world, you, you kind of have a lot of exposure there. Um, and it's a, certainly a, a much different landscape now than it was 20, 30 years ago, um, and especially with, with the caddies. And I, I think with that being said, you know, team, why don't we just kind of touch on the caddies a little bit? Maybe that spurs some, some conversation. It's been a hot topic. So, Jim, you, you don't have caddies at, at Spook Rock, but... Um, mm -hmm might have some context on here. And Ben, you do actually obviously have caddies and how is that program evolved and, and how are the caddies uh, you know, treated of the independent contractors and how does that relationship work? Are you facilitating that relationship between the member and the caddies um, and kind of dive a little bit into that? Uh, that's correct. We have a, 
a pretty substantial caddy program here at Westchester. We had um, last year about 150 different individuals that caddy here. We have about 120 kind of core caddies in the middle of the summer. All of them are classified as independent contractors. Um, we feel like we do a pretty good job of, of following the best practices, which I'm sure most of the people on this call that have caddy programs are aware of. One of the things that, that we have done in the last several years to really make that differentiation between independent contractors and employees, we have about half a dozen caddies that we pay as employees when they're doing things to help the golf operation other than caddy. And that includes helping with carts, possibly helping in the bag room a little bit, helping with tournament preparation and check-in at tournaments, whether it's a member event or a golf outing. Um, in the past, and this is going back um, five, six, seven, ten years ago, we would have caddies help with all that stuff, but they weren't being compensated for it other than what they were earning as a caddy. And that's not compliant with independent contractor um, laws. And so we have put about half a dozen caddies on payroll to come and help out before or after their loop um, to help out with other operational things at the club. Thanks, Ben. So, I mean, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to type in the chat. Uh, we've got probably two more quick topics to cover before we turn it over to uh, to Paul Fredericks to cover deferred compensation. And one of them, um, Jim, I'm going to ask you as well, um, and I'll probably lead with you. Minimum wage continues to increase. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same point, you know, how do we take care of those that have you know, been our long tenured employees for such time. And then how do you kind of take them into consideration as well, where we keep increasing the minimums, but at the same point, we can be blind to the facts or, or not as in tune with the fact that our long tenured employees might have been a little bit over the minimum, but the, because the minimum wage escalates so quickly that our long tenured employees often get forgotten. So um, can you give a little bit of context about that? Yeah, I mean, uh especially with with kind of my manager my system manager assistant pro he's the one who's kind of affected most by that and actually he's getting another another raise this year as as minimum wage has gone up and i find it necessary to keep his wage basically at the same spread or a similar spread percentage wise over what the minimum wage is um and so i've kind of done that as we've gone forward um most of my employees almost all of them are minimum wage employees uh that's what i pay um, and then obviously there's some ancillary benefits and, you know, but you get paid if you play golf and things like that, which we allow one round and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I haven't had too many issues with employees needing to be lifted up with the hourly wage, but the one real person that I do have who, who needed that, we've had to raise his rate, you know, every year. Um, and I think that uh, that most people are in that same boat. And due to all this, we've also had to raise our rates every year uh, or every other year. And obviously this year, we've obviously raised our rates again uh, to keep up with some of that. Um, so it, we haven't raised them enough, but in that sense, we have definitely raised rates to keep up with, with the rise in wages. Um, and again, of the 40 plus employees I have, I'd say 35 of them are minimum wage, which is 14, 20 in Rockland County, 15 and the rest of us uh, in downstate. <clears throat> ben, any context there as well, as far as the tenured yeah. employees? Yeah, it was. it's very, very difficult for us um, at Westchester with that minimum wage increase and, and how quickly it escalated. Um, this past year was the first year in five years there wasn't an increase in minimum wage and it increased a, a dollar per year for five straight years. And so we were in a real tough situation where um, five years ago, you could have somebody making $12, $13 that, that may have been at the club for 10, 11 years. And, and I'm not talking just about golf employees here, but grounds employees, um, you know, you name it. We have about 600 employees here in the middle of the summer. And all of a sudden, you would have a brand new employee that was making the same wage, if not more, sometimes than a tenured employee. And so we would not only have to bump them up to what minimum wage was, but then we would give them uh, a fairly substantial percentage raise to keep them above minimum wage. So our um, labor force here on average gets a two and a half percent raise every year. And 
other than this past year, there was a five year period where those raises were substantially more than two and a half percent just to keep up with minimum wage and then also have that same tenured scale. Um, so we weren't paying a brand new employee and somebody who had 10 years of experience, uh, a very similar rate. And so that that over the course of five years has raised um, our payroll budget at the club by by 30 percent. And you think about that um, with the size of our operation, even if you're a small operation, a 30 percent raise over a five year period just in labor and payroll is uh, that's a big hit member dues. <laughs> awesome. Um, thanks, team. And then we're going to start to probably round it out a little bit here. Uh, but I just want to go over some hiring rules and regulations that both of you are hiring managers at the facilities. And, you know, what are some things, Jim and, and Ben, that you're when you're going through the hiring process and hiring someone that, you know, is in the back of your mind that you need to be aware of, uh, and certainly in compliance. Jim, I'll, I'll go with you. I think that you have a little bit different. Um, you know, the management company is probably the one that is uh, obviously involved with that, but any kind of tips that you go through as far as the hiring practices, we certainly, it's it's a lot different now. And the questions you can ask someone are a lot different than we could have in the past. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, I, I don't, ask any personal questions just to be just to be safe and uh you know it's again i'm not hiring a brain surgeon so i think uh you know a lot of the people i hire are kids or senior citizens and so i'm not really i'm just looking for hours and but it's important to know that you need to post these jobs um i work in a town even though it's a management company and we try to post the jobs um and uh, i know that when hiring assistants you need to post the jobs kind of nationally um, just to make sure that, uh, that that nothing's kind of done inside. I know that's an issue, um, but I am very careful not to ask any personal questions. I think that uh, I don't think you need to. And I know that now, uh, you know, you, you can't ask what people made before. Uh, everything has kind of changed. And so you're really, you're kind of just getting a sense of their needs and what they're looking for. You're not really trying to compare it to anything. You know, like you used to, I think is a little bit different. But uh, yeah, it's it's not easy. And go ahead. Yeah, to, and to Jim's point too, we um, you have to be very careful of the questions you ask, and then we have a pretty strict process here. And and by the way, and if I, and Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong. You now, I know in Westchester County, with a job posting, have to put at least a range of what the position is worth. And so that's also a big change. And when we advertise a job here, even if it's, uh, you know, I'm calling somebody down the road and they have an assistant that I'd like to hire, the job still has to be posted for the public to see it. So when we post the job at Westchester, it goes on our club website, which also then hits all the recruiting sites, Indeed, um, in sync, all these, these sites. And so it, it opens it up for anybody to be able to apply. Um, once the person applies and then we accept the position, then it kind of triggers a background search and an I-9 check, which is um, our HR department does all of that. And then we have an onboarding process here where the, the potential employee is sent an offer sheet which outlines their job description, their pay, and also um, club regulations, the, essentially the employee handbook. And then once they get that and sign off on it, um, they come and do all the paperwork and then they have to do a, a pretty short orientation. It's about an hour that is done through our HR department. Um, I uh, fortunately don't have to do that. And I know a lot of facilities may not have an HR department, but you should probably have some of those things in place to make sure you're you're compliant. Um, and to Jim's point too, when you're interviewing people, I think it's also really important to know what you can and can't say if somebody calls you for a reference. And um, the PGA.org actually has some really good literature on that. And so you, you have to be very careful, even if they're your friends or professionals you're close with, you have to be very careful what you say about a current or or past employee if you're called for a reference so just want to put that on everybody's radar as well great point there ben um i'm going to circle back you yeah, some really good nuggets in there so if you are uh, an employer of new york city and have more than four employees as of right now you need to post 
the range in the compensation. So that's base salary plus what is anticipated as far as take home pay. Um, that must be posted on your job description. As of September 17th, everyone in New York State, you, if you have a salary position or even hourly, you need to post the compensation range for that position. So that, that will come into effect. That legislation has been passed and that will come into effect on September 17th. It's called the Pay Transparency Act. Um, and so just need to be aware of that. We'll certainly be scanning the, the bulletins. Uh, we're trying to put mechanisms in place in the National Job Board that if you are located within a state or you're hiring within the state, that that information needs to be on there. Um, and then also, Ben, there's a great point as far as the job description. It is, a, it is a law that if you have a job description, it needs to be posted in a public forum that you're hiring for. Uh, some opportunities you may not, not have a job description, then you're exempt. You don't have to post it. But if a job description exists that needs to be posted and needs to be out there in, in a public forum, um, you certainly would, would get in trouble uh, for that. Now, it's, gentlemen, we're going to kind of put a bow on this part of the topic uh, or the conversation for wage an hour, but I just want to open it up to you both for a couple of minutes here, kind of give you the floor if there's anything that you wanted to address. And, and more importantly, you've seen how the wage and hour laws have kind of escalated over the years. And what are things that you're you're doing and to try to become you know more aware um, of, of compliance and make sure you have things you know buttoned up on your end. And also you know, what are things that you feel that you're afraid of or that are concerns that may be keeping you up at night that can really impact our industry? Um, Jim, I'll, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know about anything in terms of that keeps me up at night other than uh, than making sure I'm kind of doing it the right way. I will say that it's very easy to ignore these things because our employees are, you know, we all get along with our employees. We're all good relations to it, but one disgruntled employee and any little thing that you're cutting corners on becomes a big problem for your whole organization. And so you need to kind of really think ahead in those terms. Um, it, you know, you may save a hundred bucks here, or whatever, whatever, but in the end, it's very important uh, that your, your, your T's are, are crossed and I's dotted when it comes to paying your employees. Uh, because not everybody remains a happy employee all the time. Uh, and, and again, that's the kind of way I approach everything is just not trying to have an issue. Uh, and, and luckily for me, and I think Ben's in the same case, we have serious people we can bounce these things off of who also care about things and, and, and kind of pay attention to what's going on. So I don't do that alone. Uh, but, but everyone needs to really think about that. Thanks, Jim. Ben, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll chime in there. And I think um, I think Jim hit a really good point there with, um, you know, re again, rely on the experts, whether it's an HR department or your managers. I think a lot of time um, club managers and people are making decisions with employees on the non-golf part of golf facilities. They kind of almost put the golf professionals to, hey, they're in this little basket. Um, well, don't worry, they're taken care of. They make all this money teaching, blah, blah, blah our golf professionals need to be hired and treated a little bit more like the non-golf employees at clubs. And that's where a manager or assistant manager or somebody who's hiring um, kind of next door can really help if, if you don't have an HR department. But again, I would just, I would really, I would encourage anybody to talk, everybody to talk to the experts on this because we certainly aren't, but we've learned a lot doing it. And then um, Jonathan, to your one last point, the only thing that, that scares mm -hmm. me about all this is just making sure that we can compensate our golf employees well enough to, to retain them and also to give them the quality of life that, that we all deserve, which we know has been a hot topic recently. Um, I feel that if you do pay employees correctly, which we're doing it, it's actually beneficial for them. Um, the fear with that is it just becomes unsustainable because um, it, it does cost the clubs more money to do it, but eventually they're gonna have to catch up to make sure that everybody's paid correctly. Yeah, and to retain good, good staff, good, talented people in this business. It's very important. It's certainly becoming harder than ever. Um, I think that anyone that has tried to hire a position specifically in a system position or even outside operations position, uh, you know, it's incredibly hard to find the talent. So that's where we're seeing compensation starting to increase even to levels, you know, way above the salary threshold 
uh, which is fantastic. So then we're kind of getting into an area where we're compliant, just be out of out of necessity, which is which is fantastic. So. Uh, ben and Jim, I wanted to thank you sincerely for your time this afternoon. Uh, for all those that are on the call, these are the two individuals that I certainly lean on. Uh, should I have any questions, you can you can tell that they are experts in this area. But to Ben and Jim's point before, you know, if you have any questions whatsoever, there are resources, whether it's on the New York Department of Labor, the Connecticut Department of Labor websites, and then specifically the, the call to action is if you feel that you may be in a gray area as far as compliance, seek legal counsel. Um, there are resources on both these websites that you can submit your question and they will get back to you with that is free of charge to you. But again, um, to Jim, Jim, your point before, it only takes one, one disgruntled employee to kind of raise the flag and then that kind of blows back on, and hopefully not you, but it certainly can. So we just want to eliminate any exposure that we have um, and being that um, these, these rules and regulations are becoming more and more frequent and they're kind of buckling down on, on our industry. Um, so that's obviously incredibly important. So gentlemen, thank you for your time this afternoon. Uh, hopefully everyone kind of enjoyed that. We'll still leave, if you have any questions or comments, the chat is there for you to ask them. Uh, should you have any, please feel free. We'll try to answer them. But I'm going to also now turn it over to uh, Paul Fredericks. Paul is with us uh, from the PJ of America. Paul um, handles our deferred compensation program um, that you may or might not heard about, but as of the PGA Merchandise Show was rolled out to all PGA members. Uh, and really, and in, in, in what it means at its core is that if you are a PGA professional, based on your, uh, your volunteer efforts, you can sign up and can accrue um, what would be considered points towards deferred compensation. Uh, which becomes then vested and a vehicle that would be considered almost a retirement program for you. Um, so, Paul, it is great to see you. Thank you for taking time out of your calendar to be with uh, the Metropolitan PJ Professionals. And I'll turn over to you for some insights on deferred compensation, what exactly it is, um, what does it mean, and um, certainly answer any questions that our professionals might have this afternoon or this morning. Perfect. Uh, thank you again, Jonathan, for inviting me uh, um, to this meeting. I'm really excited to, you know, be here and, and help sh spread the word about the deferred compensation. Uh, I know this is something that we've been, uh, at least at the PGA, tr trying to get out to you guys for the past couple of years. And now that we finally got approval from the IRS to do so, um, really excited to finally launch it on April 1st. So, um, kind of what I'm going to do is just kind of run through uh, just a high-level uh, presentation. Uh, of what deferred compensation is and how the plan works. Uh, we'll have some FAQs to answer and then I'll open it up to, to you and to anybody else who may have some additional questions about uh, deferred comp. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, jump into it. I'm gonna share my screen real quick and uh, we'll get going. Perfect. Uh, can you guys see uh, my screen? Yes, yep, we can see it. Okay, awesome. Perfect. So we'll go ahead and uh, just dive uh, right into the uh, presentation here for deferred comp. So uh, what is uh, deferred compensation? So just kind of a high level overview here. So essentially it's just compensation that is set aside uh, to be paid out on a later date. Um, so this will typically start paying out um, at retirement when an individual reaches or when an individual re reaches a certain age. This can come in a variety of different um, plans, including just standard retirement plans, pension plans, stock option plans, et cetera. The, kind of the benefits associated with our deferred compensation plan is tax deferred growth, um, the ability to choose your investments um, from a wide variety of different funds. Um, this is designed to supplement your future retirement income. So it's the whole point of this program is to help make your retirement a little bit more comfortable uh, once you reach the age of 65. And then uh, the contributions are coming directly from the PGA. So nothing's going to be coming out of your pocket. It's not going to affect your paycheck in any way. Uh, the, the money that's sent to you is going to be coming directly from the PGA. So the whole goal um, behind our program was to be able to reasonably co compensate um, our PGA members for performing services that advance our purpose, which is gr what growing the game of golf. 
So working with the IRS, we wanted to create a plan whereby members that participate in certain activities that meet specific performance objectives can earn points uh, toward a deferred compensation uh, plan. Um, so we wanted to design this to provide uh, supplemental retirement income for our members once they reach the age of 65. So members can register now and start earning points on April 1st of this year. So that's when the plan year officially starts and it runs till March 31st of the following year, which is consistent with uh, the PGA's fiscal year. And that's how on um, that plan year will run uh, each year going forward. As far as eligibility works for this plan, so all PGA members in good standing that are working in the US are eligible for this plan. Uh, class F members will not be eligible to earn points while in class F status. And then finally, PGA associates and university students will not be eligible for the plan at this time. So uh, as far as uh, how the contributions and withdrawals work, um, so contributions to the plan are made only by the PGA of America. Uh, there'll be no outside uh, contributions or participant contributions. Um, currently, the maximum amount an eligible member can receive in a plan year is $1,500. So this amount was set by the IRS, but this can change from year to year. We anticipate that the, the amount that it'll grow to is about 3% each year is the max that, that we can increase it to. Um, but that's ultimately will be determined by the IRS. Um, so the actual dollar amount that a participant can receive will depend on several different factors. So nobody is guaranteed 1500. I just kind of want to get that out there because we had a lot of questions about that. So the amount will depend on a couple of different things. So the total amount of points earned for the plan year, and we'll touch on the points in just a moment, the overall participation in the plan. So the overall active members who are eligible um, to participate in the plan, um, as well as the overall contribution for the PGA for that specific plan year. So those are the three main factors that will uh, determine the, the contributions amount there. Withdrawals. Um, so withdrawals here will start at the age of 65 years old. Funds cannot be withdrawn before 65. There will be some instances where hardship withdrawals may be available in limited circumstances. So that will be evaluated on a one-off basis. Um, so members will receive um, payments and plan benefits and monthly installments over a 10 year period once they reach 65. This will be known as the distribution period. So no taxes will be withheld on these distributions. So any tax related questions, just keep in mind that you should consult with a qualified tax professional. And then loans and rollovers are not permitted within this plan as well. Um, real quickly, just touching on investment options. So there will be over 30 different investment options to choose from, and these will all be mutual funds. So you have options to choose from equities, uh, fixed income funds, index funds, as well as target date funds. Um, so members can move into different funds at any time that they want to, to meet their investment goals. The default investment option will be T. Rowe Price target date funds. Um, but like I said, if you don't want to stay in a specific fund or if you don't like the default option, you can move out of that at any time. All right, so point system. So uh, point system is going to be pretty important here. This is how you, you earn points and earn credit toward or receiving uh, contributions toward this plan. So members will earn points uh, towards the plan after the completion of certain specified performance objectives and activities. So a member must earn a minimum of 200 points in a given plan year to be eligible to receive any sort of contribution from the PGA. So if a member does not reach that 200 point threshold, uh, such points will be forfeited and they cannot be carried over to future plan years. Uh, so, keep, so keep that in mind. As long as you reach that 200 point minimum, you'll be eligible to re receive some sort of contribution from us. As far as how the reporting structure works for, for these points, um, members will be able to keep track of their points on pga.org or through the new PGA member app um, that is currently being developed. Um, that will um, be available uh, for members on April 1st as well. Um, just got word of that that app uh, will be available to, to download by then, but that's going to be the, the primary and best way to um, keep track of your points. And we'll talk a little bit more of that um, in just a few moments. So um, the reporting process will also be a multi-pronged. 
meaning that will it will include self attestation by the member that's submitting for points and they'll need the attestation of another active PGA member in good standing. And depending on what sort of activity they complete, we may have to verify um, that activity by any other data sources that are available to us if needed. And then a list of eligible activities and their assigned point value will be available on the PGA.org website. Um, we will briefly look at, this is um, the next two slides, we'll, we'll cover those uh, 16 activities. Um, so as you can see on this first slide here, um, you'll notice that some activities, um, for instance, um, PJ Junior League will have an option for 100% of the points, 50% of points, as well as 25% of points. So some activities you can earn partial credit on to where if you can't be fully involved with a certain activity, you can at least earn some credit um, toward your deferred compensation plan. Um, others, for instance, um, like the PGA Family Golf, the only option would be 100%. So you can either fully commit to that or not. Um, if we continue down here, you'll notice that there's also philanthropic activities that you can uh, take advantage of, volunteer activities, and even um, 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 engaging on your um, PGA member profile on PGA.com. Um, you can simply earn just uh, 50 points by simply having your profile set up and updated. So that's a quick and easy way to get 50 points right off the back and just making sure your profile is up to date. Um, and then that way you're, you would only need at least 150 points to reach that uh, 200 point minimum threshold. So um, we'll probably have more questions on this once we're done here. I'd be happy to, to touch on those as well, but I just want to kind of give you a, just a brief overview of what sort of activities are available. like family golf, junior league, um, inclusive golf communities. We've gotten a lot of feedback and suggestions on those already. So um, we'll probably be sending out more information on that as well. Um, as far as the PGA member app goes, so coming spring 2023, so it will be available by that April 1st uh, deadline um, launch date. So you'll be able to download the app you'll be able to start submitting points and keeping track of your points on that April 1st date if you have activities to submit by then. Um, this is going to be the quickest and easiest way for you all to, one, submit your points and keep track of your points as well. Um, we will be adding more features to this app as well. Um, we'll and we'll keep more announcements in that and, 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 and let you guys know that as more information becomes available. But for the initial launch, um, it's designed mainly for deferred compensation as far as submitting those points and keeping track of those points. So um, we're excited to let, let you guys know that that's, that's coming out. And then uh, real briefly, as far as uh, FAQs go, so we have a couple of uh, main questions that we've been getting a lot. So we wanted to touch on these first and then we'll open it up to any additional questions that um, Jonathan or anyone else has. Um, so how will the funds be uh, administered? So CoreBridge, so for those of you who have GRP accounts, CoreBridge Financial, uh, who also administers GRP, will be the administrator for this plan as well. So just, uh, just note that if you do have a GRP account, you will need to register separately for this plan as well. Uh, when and how can I enroll? So enrollment started at the PGA show this past January, but you can go ahead and enroll right now on pga.org. Um, there'll also be a QR code that we'll have at the end of this presentation where you, if you want, you can just take your phone out and scan it and you can sign up. It takes no more than three to five minutes. A very simple and easy process. Um, so with this plan, does this impact the maximum amount that I can contribute uh, to my 401k or any other retirement account? Uh, so no, it just won't have any other impact on any other account, whether it's another employer sponsored plan or an IRA. Um, so this will function completely separately from those. And then how does a deferred compensation relate to Golf Retirement Plus? So GRP will continue uh, as a separately managed program. Eligible members can participate in both Golf Retirement Plus and deferred compensation. So it's not replaced in uh, GRP in any way. Um, so when will I receive the funds that I've earned? So we expect that eligible members will receive their 
uh, contributions to their respective accounts around 90 to 120 days following the conclusion of the uh, program year. So for example, for this first plan year that runs um, from April 1st of this year to uh, March 31st of 2024, we expect that those initial contributions will go sometime between July and August of 2024 into members accounts. And then will there be any changes to the point system in the coming years? Um, so short answer, probably yes. So with this being a new program, um, we will be working on an ongoing basis to uh, optimize the program to best support our members and, and our mission. So we will evaluate the current point structure um, throughout the years and determine whether any changes need to be made. Um, we're still kind of ironing out some of the um, the wording for some activities, um, the descriptions for some of them as well, just to make sure they kind of fall in line with you know, what our ultimate goal is here and also working with the IRS to make sure it meets their standards as well. Um, Cause there are a lot of activities that we did submit that we wanted to get added here that just simply weren't approved by the IRS. So um, we, we want to ultimately make this program as beneficial to our members as possible. Um, but just keep in mind that there are some restrictions that we have to, to follow and stay in line with, but um, that's, um, pretty much as far as FAQs go that I have on my end. Um, this last slide um, is the QR code for Deferred Comp. So if you haven't signed up, you can do so right now just by simply scanning this code or just by going to pga.org. Like I said, it takes no more than three to five minutes to do so. And uh, it's gonna be a great way to help all of you, no matter whether you're just starting out um, as a, a PGA professional or if you've been with the in the industry for you know, 30, 40 years. It's a great way to help just earn supplemental income and, and make, make retirement just a little bit easier for you down the line. So that's pretty much all I have on my end, Jonathan. Um, I'm sure you have some questions and you may want to add, add to some things, but um, I'll kind of open it up uh, to everybody now. Yep, I, I have some, but I'm going to wait. I'll wait till the, someone on the, the call has a question. Um, John, go ahead. Uh, yes, Paul, well, appreciate you doing this for us. My name is John Hobbins, and we have a, a HOPE program that we have a number of retired professionals who have reached the age of 65 that are involved in. So from what you said there, my understanding is that throughout this season and into uh, into next season, even though they're 65 already, they would earn their credits, their points, and then uh, they would get a payout there in August. Is that correct? Paul, you're on mute. Apologies for that, but correct. So yeah, members who are 65 or older are still eligible for the plan. So how that would work is um, once they, you know, reach that minimum threshold or, or exceed that the minimum point threshold and they earn their points and receive that contribution, essentially what will happen is those funds will go right into their account and then be distributed right back out. Um, so it, it won't like sit or linger in there. It, it'll essentially just go in and then come right back out to them. Um, and what's the vehicle, a, Paul, for dis distribution? Is it going to be a direct deposit or does the, does the golf professional determine that vehicle? So the golf professional will be able to determine that. So since Corbridge is the one essentially managing the and administering the funds, they'll have the option for, you know, like a direct deposit or ACH to your bank account, or if you just want a check sent to you for the amount that you received, you can do that too. Um, more information on that process will be sent out by Corbridge once you actually receive funding and then the plan year actually starts. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to choose how you want to receive your funds. All right, and I think that April 1st is the start of the program. So it's very important, I would imagine, for all of our golf professionals to get signed up now, which takes, all of about 25 seconds, I think it took me when Jonathan brought it to my attention. So, uh, but sign up now because then you know anything you do from April first on will be credited. Whereas if you if you don't sign up to later and do something, then you obviously you're not going to receive those points. Correct. And then you you do have 60 days from when you actually complete act, an activity 
to um, submit for it for points. Once you get outside of that 60 day window, you, you can no longer um, you know, submit for it. So yeah, the sooner you sign up, the better, because that will allow you to then you know, submit activities throughout the, the full plan year. Right, and then you said submit for points. So is the individual gonna be responsible for submitting his or her points? Or is the is the section responsible? It would be the individual. So that's this is where um, either going to PGA.org or, or really the, the easiest way would be to download the app because the app will let you select the activity, then your level of involvement, and then once you submit that, it'll ask you to select another PGA professional to attest that you did complete that activity, and then once they attest it, because they'll they'll get notified through an email, uh, once they confirm that you'll get credited those points right away. So that's going to be the, the, the best way, at least for most so, of us. Yeah, so that app is basically the lifeline for everything. Correct. Yeah, it's going to be the, like I said, the simplest and easiest way. You can still, if you, if you don't want to use the app or have issues with it, you can still submit the points on pga.org. Um, but that app is going to be probably everyone's best friend once the plan year starts. And like I said, that that's not available to download now, but it will be available by April 1st. Great, that's very helpful. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Paul, uh, Jeff Voorhees here. I'm the ED of the section. Thanks for coming on uh, and spending some time with us today. This is obviously a really important uh, topic. Um, unlike most of the members on the call, I've been exposed to this a little bit, you know, annual meeting, uh, we had a conference uh, prior to the PGA show, so I, I feel like I'm a little bit ahead in terms of uh, digesting th this a little bit. Um, one thing that I think is pretty natural for most people is that they're going to get a little bit it, naturally so kind of bogged down in the point system and, and where they can and can't get points and how does this apply to me and um, I guess and I don't want to put words in your mouth at all because you probably won't say what I'm about to say but my takeaway from the few presentations that I've seen, the folks that I've spoken to about this is, I think the PGA of America wants as many members as possible to max out. I think it's easy to look at the point system as limiting and like, oh, gee, I don't do that. I don't do that. I'm not going to, um, I think, and, and, and for the members on the call, you have to understand that this was a, a treacherous process with the IRS of what can and can't qualify in terms of uh, furthering the association's mission with while well, sidestepping the inurement issues. Um, but I still believe that the PGA's goal here was to get as many people as possible to max out the points and max out, well, you know, that, that $1,500 a year uh, contribution to your plan. So try not to look at it as limiting. I think Paul, you mentioned it. Uh, uh, th th this, the, that point grid that we looked at before is going to change possibly as early as this year, but certainly at the end of year one. So uh, if you have any concerns, if, if I, as you've said, Paul, if members have things that they do that they think might, send them to me, send them to Jonathan, uh, because we can hopefully affect the growth and development of this thing. And I, again, Paul, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I just want to put a positive spin on that grid and not have people look at it as potentially limiting to them individually. Yeah, no, I, that's a great point. And like, uh, ultimately, our goal is for this program to benefit as many members as possible, because we haven't been able to have a plan like this up until now. So the fact that we have something out right now for you all is 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 huge. Uh, and like I said, this first year, there are definitely going to be probably at least some, some speed bumps along the way and, and definitely a lot of questions. Um, but that's why we, we want constant feedback. We actually do um, have an email address dedicated solely to deferred compensation. So that, that's, that's going to be deferred compensation at pgahq.com to where if you have any specific questions, either on your account or if you have, you know, just suggestions on the plan itself, um, you can send the, your questions to that email address. And then myself, Christy, Arjun, any, anybody else that's really heavily involved with the program, we can take a look at that. That way, if, if maybe not for this year, because there's probably not too many more changes we're going to be able to make for this year, but definitely for the following plan years, we, we can take those thoughts into consideration and, and try to improve the plan to, to make it fit as many people as possible. Noah, 
Uh, Tim Garvin had a question. So could you make sure he's unmuted so he can ask that and we can all be entertained by that question? <laughs> yeah, uh, you will be entertained for sure. That's why um, I'm here. <laughs> um, thank you everybody for doing that um, and presenting everything. Um, we just we just listened to a, a, a presentation about hour and wage um, paying uh, people on duty um, for, uh, you know, uh, practicing, playing. Um, but then we go to uh, PGA deferred compensation where we have to be off property to some extent to be able to earn these rewards. Um, can you address that? And can you address why uh, Golf Retirement Plus isn't being pushed into this? So in regards to that, unfortunately, I can't speak too much in that just because I wasn't involved in a lot of those back-end conversations that got the program started. I've been with the PGA since November, so I'm still relatively new to a lot of what's going on and how a lot of these programs work. So I wish I could speak to that more, but unfortunately, I, I, I just can't, like, as, as far as, you know, being involved in the, the conversations left the what activities, you know, were, you know, considered eligible and, and, and what were. So I wish I had a better answer for you, but unfortunately i just can't speak to that right now oh, okay can, so, we, can we email that question can tim email that to deferred comp at pj headquarters.com yeah we can certainly do that and 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 that way um we, we can dive a little bit deeper into that but yes unfortunately i wasn't involved in those conversations so i, I can't speak directly to all that right now well i, I can i can take some of this just because um for some of the members, it might be the first time going through the point system. And Tim has a really good point about what you can control at your facility and the hours away from your facility, like PJ Hope would be an example. Um, there's also examples that you can control at the facility, whether it's a PGA Junior League team, uh, if you can host it, if you're a captain, uh, you know, mentoring a PGA, you know, mentoring an associate into becoming a PGA professional qualifies at points as well. Um, and I guess that kind of pairs with another question I have for Paul. Paul, is there a maximum amount of points that you can earn in a calendar year, right? So you don't, a member doesn't have to feel like feel that they have to check every single box 100%. Um, if they can't achieve the activities or points away from their facility, so th there is no maximum amount. So as long as a member reaches 200 points, Sorry, Paul, yeah. I muted you instead of me. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so th th there are no, there is no maximum amount of points. So there's only a minimum of 200. So as long as you reach that 200 point threshold, you would be eligible for some sort of contribution. If you continue to earn more points, that would essentially only work in your favor um, to where you, you, you gives you a better chance of, of re receiving that full $1,500 amount. Um, but there, but there is no no maximum per se. You can earn if you wanted to grind it out. You can earn ten thousand points if you wanted to. Do we uh, know the number for the fifteen hundred? Fifteen hundred is a maximum payout, correct, Paul? Correct. And how but, many points is required to get to that? So we don't have a calculator. We don't have like a, a firm point value for that because that's that's where I said it's going to depend on the participation, the overall participation the overall points that are earned by everybody, and then the um, money that's set aside by the PGA. So we won't have like a, you know, you need say 2000 points or 1500 points to get that full 1500 value just because that could fluctuate just by the participation in the plan um, or the total points that were earned by all the members who were active in the plan. So um, yeah, we, we, we do. We, and anybody yeah, I, that's I, participated in a gambling pool is, is maybe familiar with uh, with how the, the, this might work. Uh, Paul, and given that, is there are there any safeguards in place for people sort of artificially devaluing the points to your like you said, if that if some number of people earn some astronomical number 
uh, will after some point, will they not be considered in terms of calculating the value of, of all the regular people's points, so to speak? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we will be tracking the, the point value on uh, a constant basis. So if we ever do see any outliers that just seem, you know, higher than usual or just not consistent with how everyone else is submitting, um, we will definitely look into that. And we would definitely won't be afraid to, you know, reach out and, and potentially call somebody out for maybe, you know, reporting points, you know, that not correctly um, per se. Um, but that's where the self the attestations uh, come into play with the self attestation, the attestation of another another member. I mean, as you as you all know, golf is a honor sport and you know you're supposed to you know do the right thing you know keep the score the right way um and we kind of base this program off off that um so we, we don't foresee people trying to take advantage and, and submit points inaccurately or you know falsely but if if we do start noticing something they know that that's where we have the discretion on our end too to you know look into that you know uh, use other data sources to, to, to research to make sure something was done correctly or if all of sales reach out to the member directly to just to you know get more clarification on, on what's going on there but it, it just just a quick question i know you were careful not to call this a pension fund um or the pga was um that's not a that's not a a, a new idea this has been going through the pga for years um as far as some pension fund or whatever I think uh, Golf Retirement Plus was actually uh, solving that problem for some period of time. Um, but I will send a national an email to ask them that question and why they're separate. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason why uh, they're separate is because this plan is eligible for more, for more members. Um, where Golf Retirement Plus was usually designed for like like head pros head professionals this allows more people to take part and to get some sort of retirement benefit down the line um so that's that's why they're you know considered separate plans okay thank you yeah Well, I certainly have a couple of questions and I'll, I'll give the, the members some time if they have any others as well to please feel free to interrupt me and chime in. Um, do you have any context on, um, I guess, my, let me leave with this. And if a PGA member conducts a junior league team, for example, and they have two professionals that are coaching this team, are the points split? If there's a 250 point max, are they split? Uh, 125 each or does each professional receive the full you know the full amount should they fulfill the duties yeah so each professional would receive the full amount as long as they satisfied that requirement for either 100 percent of points or 50 percent of points so uh, it wouldn't be split across the board it would be you know the full credit would go to that individual as long as they completed you know all the requirements for that specified activity Got it. Um, and then giving everyone a chance to maybe take out a calculator. Paul, do you have any insight on how much is in the fund right now? When I look at this, I look at it as like a, a pot, right? And to Jeff's point, it's like a pot of gold, right? So yeah. do we have any idea of how much is, is in the account right now? So um, the amount that was allocated, I believe, is going to be around $5 million for this first plan year. So the, the the final number is still TBD, but from what we've heard and everything on our end, it's going to be around that five million mark. And then maybe my last question here for you, Paul, and because I've seen it before, um, certainly this probably is can be perceived that benefits the the younger members a lot more with interest in compounding, right? Uh, but again, I think this is a giant, personally, a giant win for the association. And when we look at things as far as attracting people into our industry, it's one of the most difficult things we have now. But now that we see that we have our wages are increasing, um, you know, cer certainly the, the work-life integration is a conversation that's being talked about. 
But at the same point, if you just imagine that you're a college student and you understand that you can become a PGA member and then have, um, you know, based on your efforts, be vested into a retirement vehicle by the age of 22 is amazing. Um, and certainly would be a, a retention, um, you know, something to think about retaining PGA members as well. Do you have any insight? And I believe I saw this graphic uh, maybe at the PGA show as far as what $1,500 in interest and compounding turns into like after 30 years and how significant that is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you give me a moment, I can pull up a couple figures um, that we used for our PGA show. And this will kind of help illustrate a, a little bit more as to essentially the, the power of compound interest and in, especially for our young members, but even for, you know, members in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who can still take advantage of this. Um, so if you see right here, um, this, these are all just uh, hypothetical projections based off an annual uh, return of 6% annually. But we're looking at over the a, a 10 year savings uh, projection here um, with the uh, interest at about 6%, you're looking at just over $22,000 um, off of the base principal interest of just over $16,000. So it, your investment's grown by a little over a third as we dive a little bit deeper into 20 and 30 years, um, you'll start to notice that um, interest start to really um, do some work and let your money go to work for you there. So by 20 years, your money is almost doubled. And then by 30 years, you've almost tripled your investment um, at just under $130,000. Um, and this is simply just based off if you've reached um, the $1,500 amount each year for you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Like I said earlier in the presentation, we expect that maximum amount of $1,500 to go up a little bit each year. So these numbers could very well potentially be a lot higher down the road. Um, but this is a, you know, just a, a basic projection and outline of, you know, what compound interest can, can, can do. You know, a lot of people may say oh, $1,500 may not be a whole lot, but in the grand scheme of things over time, it could be a nice, uh, add a nice little sizable dent to your retirement savings and make things a little bit uh, more comfortable there for you. Hey, Paul, as a uh, hypothetical, so if a golf professional 65 years of age contributes his or her time and maxes out at 1500 a year for the next say seven or eight years can they just leave that money in that fund to grow and compound as you mentioned um or do they have to take it out so as the golf professional is it my choice when i want to take my money out so uh, with this plan once you reach 65 distributions have to start coming out so whether you're you know, 65 or 66 and you completed a plan year, deposit went in, that money is gonna come right back out. Or if you're you know, 30 years old, you saved throughout your right. entire lifetime there. And then once you reach 65, then the funds have to start coming out. You don't have a, an option, unfortunately. To like is that because of the government regulations? That, that's the way the plan was set up. Um, so it's considered a 457 plan. Um, but the way we had to work with the IRS, we, we had some, unfortunately, we, we, we were restricted as to what limitations we could give members for distributions. And one of them was the, you know, essentially a, uh, a payment plan of, ten, of uh, 10 years where it had to be distributed. So the IRS had basically decided because of the type of plan it is when the distributions had to be taken, not the PGA, correct? Correct. Yeah. All right. So I think that's very, I want that to be very clear because it sounds like the PGA of America did not have a choice, much like when you reach, I think it's 72 and a half that you have to take your IRA uh, payments out. So this is yeah, a, be, yeah. it's a government like, regulation, not a PGA decision. Yeah. So yeah, we, we try to advocate for having a little bit more flexibility with distributions as to whether you know, you, you could at least defer, delay the payment for a couple of years or you know, the option to maybe 
you know, take like a one-time distribution, like you could have like a, you know, obviously like an IRA or 401k, but this was a little bit more restrictive, but the fact that we at least have something in place, at least in my opinion, is a huge benefit than, than not having anything at all. I would totally agree. Regardless of age, I think it's a great thing that BJ is uh, designated and obviously putting into action here in about what, 15 days. Yeah, it's it's right around the corner, we're essentially two weeks away from, you know, launch date. So we're all excited. And I feel like once once the ball gets is rolling and the April 1st, um, you know, start date rolls around and people start earning points, um, you know, I think it's, it's going to be a, a great asset to to the PGA. And, and like Jonathan was saying, uh, attracting more members and retaining more members, um, I think it's going to be a huge tool in that. Yes, thank you very much for those answers. Perfect. Did, uh, do you have any other questions, Jonathan? Anybody else want to chime in? I have a very small one, um, and it has to do with the allocation. Uh, do we have control whether and how it's invested, whether like, so if we're younger per se, we want to be a little bit more aggressive in our investments because uh, we have a little bit longer runway. Are we able to do so? Um, or is it just, it's just co co contributed and corporate manages where, where it gets vested? So um, you will have the ability to essentially manage your own portfolio within the plan. So um, like I was saying, the, the default investment option is going to be a targeted retirement fund, um, just kind of like most, you know, employer sponsored plans or even IRAs will kind of default to a, a target date fund. But once um, that initial deposit is put in, you will then have the capability to exchange and move out. So if you want to move into like an index fund or if you want to diversify and then, you know, be in three or four different funds at once, you can do that. So um, that is one of the like I said, one of the big benefits and perks about the plan is you're not stuck in this tunnel of you know you can only be in a certain investment or the institution manages it for you. You have the flexibility to to move your money around within the the thirty funds that are available or so. Great, thank you, Paul. That's all I have. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, Paul, thank you very much for your uh, help there. And should you have any questions for Paul, deferred compensation at pgahq.com. That'll be the email where you can send questions. And Tim Garvin will share with us what he finds out at a future date. Jonathan, I want to thank you and Ben and Jim for, uh, for an excellent program this morning. We appreciate it. Uh, you've brought a lot of uh, clarity to some of the situations that we as golf professionals face. And Paul, we want to thank you for coming on with the deferred compensation. Uh, going forward next week, we have Coker, Kirk Ogori on Tuesday morning, which is always entertaining. We'll be, that is a Zoom only because we'll be in shop and in small quarters. And then the following week, Sam Wiley, and then our, our spring meeting on April 10th and our educational spring summit down at Trump Golf Links Ferry Point. That'll be on April 25th. And uh, hopefully we're gonna have very good weather. We decided to go outside this time because we wanted the, the teaching to be interactive. So both James Siegman and uh, Bernie Najar will be working with some of our professionals and we'll have some amateurs there so we can actually see interactive teaching on grass, in the bunkers, on the uh, the practice facility. Bernie does a good job with his uh, force plates and creating distance. And you know he'll kind of take us through when you should attempt to create distance with a golfer and then when maybe you should attempt to create more fitness for the golfer versus the distance. And James is just one of the best in the world at short game. So tune in for those. You can find those on our website. And then until next week, we sign off, have a good weekend, get some sunshine. And let's uh, let's get into a warm April. Thank you, everybody. Good day.